Da. So, then... Um, yeah, I started making music like full time, which was a dream come true, of course. Definitely. And then I think two years later, around 2007, 2006, actually, yes. um, the first like Jekyll and Hyde tracks, they became really popular, really fast. And that is your project. That's yeah. not yeah. Co or Ghost no, produced. No, it was just back in the day, I did not do Ghost production. <laughs> I just had a lot of aliases. Yes. Uh, I worked at the record company, so we needed to fill CD compilations as well. Um, so I, I think I had like 15 or 20 different aliases. Wow. And I made a lot of different... <laughs> it's impossible to make websites for all of them and no, take care of the social no, media. No. So was it a natural step to then go into Ghost and co-producing since you anyways had so many aliases? It's impossible to take care of all of them in the sense of building up a brand touring having social media for all of i mean 15 areas it's like impossible was that the back, thought behind yeah, it or just mm, an offer back then like building your profile was less important than it is nowadays yes. uh, because yeah if you had a different type of track you could put a name on it put it on a cd and, f and fill it up or and i mean most of the money came through the sales came through the sales exactly yeah, yeah. So you had to switch, or did someone ask you to ghost produce? What was the first, no, I, first that, step into ghost that, production? That record company went bankrupt in 2009. Okay. So then I uh, I started for myself. So I, I built my new studio, started there. But former colleagues of mine, they were into managing new artists. They started their own management companies. And they were like, hey, is it possible that you can produce this guy's new yes. song. I was like, yeah, why not? It's like, and that's how everything started rolling. Okay, and your first big ghost produced hit? Well, you know that one, I I, guess. I know, but we're not allowed to talk about it, right? You're Well, not... no, I mean, I think the first big one uh, is Quintino's Epic. Okay, was, yeah. yeah. So this gave you probably a boost and a lot of other people that started asking you for ghost yeah. productions, because yeah. that's usually how it goes. You write a yeah. hit and then... Everyone wants something from everyone. You. Everyone wants something from you. So you're now in a comfortable position to pick who you ghost produce for. Well, yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're now nine years later. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of things happened in between. But yeah. so what happened in between? A lot of like I, I mean, smaller ghost produced songs, songs that didn't take off. People rejected songs. Like probably everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything happened. Um, but also, of course, there was a big boom starting around 2012. Yes. Like all stars aligned. The music was the same in the United States, in Europe. Yeah. EDM and in, had and like a Asia. big, so, big boom. Big boom. So no matter if you release the track, it would do equally well in yeah. the United States as in Asia. While nowadays it's already more divided. Like US is more yeah. hip hop orientated now again. Asia is maybe still big room harder styles so, so the, the big phase of edm is maybe already over a little is that something you could say or are we still in it i mean we're still in it everything yeah. is being produced electronically i, okay, I yeah. just feel that every continent has its own like genres which yes. they like more i think germany is very like deep house still and the us maybe more big room yeah but don't you feel that like back in 2012, 2014, everybody was in Big Room, into the yes. Big Room sound? And that was, I hated that phase, to be honest, because uh -huh. I, I like more like either the underground chilled stuff or deep house acoustic stuff yeah. or pop music is also fine for me. But this straight in your face, just kick and one big synthesizer. Yeah. I mean, for a festival environment, yes, it works. Exactly. But so that I never, the whole I never played the <clears throat> big festival stages, so um, it's not the kind of music I could play at the clubs where I was DJing. Yeah, and it's nothing I would ever listen to at home. Yeah, it's like it's a little too much. Yeah. but you you produced quite a lot of these big room bangers. Yeah. Is it easier to make them? Because when I listen to them, it's usually like a big kick and one synth. And if you figured that one out, it's it's easy to do again. Or, like, I mean, 
every dance, every genre of dance music is formula is formulated yes. music. So, in an essence, yeah, it's easier then. But it's the same for you. If you know how to produce a certain sure. type of song, then the sure. second one is easier to you make. You open up the old project and <laughs> change I, ne I never done that, actually. <laughs> but, but, but there are a lot of songs out there where you know exactly, yeah. okay, they opened the old project and, yeah. and repeated what they what they already made. It's, yeah. it's the safe bet. Yeah. But if I would have done that yeah. in my scenario, then tracks would sound too similar. With with different clients, yeah, of course, you and have then you, get, yeah, you have to start over every time and try to at least create some sort of distinction in yourself. So when you start working for someone new, you listen to all of their old stuff probably and analyze them a little to to know to to kind of learn their style in a in a sense and implement it into the new track, or you just make a song and then search for someone where it could fit. Is it more they approach you to make something for them, or you make something and then pitch it? No, they approach me to make something for them. Okay, yeah. so DJ XY approaches you and says, I need a big room banger that sounds like these other five songs. And you would then for instance, yeah. make something in between. Yeah. And because I, I also used to ghost produce, but also like four or five years ago, I stopped because I was a little frustrated making music for other people. Yeah. And they, because I'm from a DJ background, you you are not, right? You're straight into music production. So I always wanted to DJ and then I started ghost producing to just have at least an income. And they released the songs and got like gigs from these songs that I made. Absolutely. And it yeah. frustrated me like crazy. Do you have this kind of frustrated feeling seeing other people no. succeeding with your work? No. no. So you're completely separated so from that? I am uh, from for that part I am completely separated. Yeah. Never ever I mean, like <laughs> No, because I have no intention at all to be a DJ. Yes, okay. So if if I s see somebody playing that track and the crowd goes goes yes. nuts, then for me that's that's perfect. It counts if, it, yeah. if you know That it. makes me happy, actually. So. And if, <laughs> if the artist you produce for, for example, post on, on Facebook or Instagram, that's my new song, I worked so hard on it. Happens, the, yeah. Do you then smile and think, yeah, right? Or <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Because <laughs> that must be weird. Like someone else taking it's sometimes credit. It's, sometimes it's weird, but on the other hand, you know, um, it's it's the music industry. I mean, yeah. I mean, in pop, it was always like this. This is happening for such a long time already. Yes. And I even heard that like Quincy Jones was writing arrangements for Frank Sinatra back in the twenties or the thirties. I don't know. Yeah, it was always like that. Yeah. I mean, Ed Sheeran also does a lot of. Um, he writes a lot for other people and has them in mind and just pitches them the songs. Yeah. Yeah. And now he's so successful, he probably writes like 20% of all pop songs for everyone. Justin Bieber, he yeah. did parts of his album. Yeah. So And you cannot forget, like, if you produce for a certain artist who is already very popular, then that is better for your music as well. Yeah, definitely. Because if you would do it like back in the days and just have a new alias for every song, you would probably make less at the end because no one's taking care of the, the brand around it. You yeah, if it were in these times, yes. yes. But back then we had a lot of CDs. so there were Yeah, yeah. A lot but nowadays income. it yeah. just doesn't work yeah. anymore. The <coughs> producer has to be in the foreground yeah. or someone has to be... Somebody has, yeah. has to be in the foreground, yeah. So um, would you say like just making music is not really possible at the moment? Just being a producer without gigs or producing for someone else that does the gigs? How do you mean? If, if it's possible to just sit in a studio, make music, release it, and live from that? Or do you need someone to actually then play the gigs, like just being only a producer? I mean, Calvin Harris is the best example, right? Well, he's still playing, but he's, you're right. He's, he's, he's playing he's, like, like he picks Las Vegas. Words, yes. yeah. He just probably flies there and plays and back home. Exactly. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, actually he's not touring that much compared to like Steve Aoki or other people. Exactly. That are he really he picks big. his places probably. But we have also to admit his songs are extremely good and yeah. extremely poppy. So yeah. radio plays, Spotify plays, yeah. make up for it. Yeah. But I think if you're an underground producer, it might be a lot harder to make your income just with the music. Yeah, but on the other hand, sometimes I see underground tracks on spotify that have like two three million streams yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you're right it's, but it's new like uh, for example it is like possible like but you need to find your it. niche yeah 
and you need to be able to still address a certain crowd. So it still has to have like a hit potential at least. Like, cause, cause, for example, like by yeah. Fisher losing it is for a Tech House song. I've never seen a Tech House song be so big. Yeah, and also Medusa, the yeah. what was it? Heart. I da, forgot da, the name. Da, yes, da, da, that da, one. Da, da. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so it's it's getting more mainstream actually, or yeah. like this underground thing, maybe of the yeah. past. But those tracks actually do sound very commercial but you also have like, uh, weird techno stuff which can also reach yeah it's it's, it's weird because they have like the, the drums and everything is very clubby but then still mm. the the top line the vocal mm. is pop and the the yeah. main melody yeah. so that kind of works um but i do think that if you are a producer you find your niche and you can get the streams you can get your playlist you, you can be relevant in your scene as a producer then you can make money with it Okay, but giving those tracks to someone else that might be the face of it might be more beneficial. Uh, it depends on on who the artist is. Yeah, that's because there are only a few people that only make music and do not tour. Yeah, yeah. Like, and most True. of them are actually co and ghost True. producers. Yeah, you have a lot of DJs that also do ghost producing. Yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. 